All right. Let's get started. So uh, thank you so much for coming and joining us this afternoon. Uh, Gareth and I will be talking about Kubernetes, metadata that you can use alongside Kubernetes, and what that metadata can do for you. Uh, my name's Liz. I work with a container specialist company called um, Aqua Security. Aqua have a booth downstairs, so you're um, more than welcome to come and chat with us uh, at any point over the next couple of days. Uh, and I'm uh, Gareth. Uh, Gareth are uh, basically everywhere on the internet. Uh, I'm Gareth Rushkov. I work for Puppet. Uh, so if anyone wants to talk about uh, configuration management bits and pieces, uh, come find us. Um, this talk um, is hopefully the thing you've come along to see. Um, we're going to talk a bit about, like, well, what do we mean by metadata? It's in the title. People have probably heard of it. But what, what do we actually mean at a pretty fundamental level? Um, we're going to talk about what relevant features Kubernetes has for manipulating and managing and using metadata. Um, we're going to touch a little bit about, well, why we care. It's not like it's not just for its own sake. Who's it for? What can they do? And the quicker we go, the quicker we will get to a whole bunch of like, live demos and, and examples um, that are sort of there to whet your appetite for the types of things you can build with metadata. So hopefully that sounds interesting. So we'll, we'll start out with, Diane again, like, the least Kubernetes bit of the, the talk, like, well, what is metadata? Um, so heading to the dictionary is always a good idea. Um, it says metadata, data that provides information about other data, which is pretty abstract. But it is about like, having information about things you already care about. So in Kubernetes parlance, well, yeah, yes, you've got these deployments and these services and these pods. But you might want information attached to them that you can use later. Uh, getting even a bit deeper into, well, there, there are different types and different use cases for metadata. Uh, we'll go and ask the librarians. Because if anyone knows a librarian, they're obsessed with metadata. Um, and libraries are cool. So let's go there. Um, the sort of, and, uh, this sort of understanding metadata paper breaks it down into three sort of main areas. Um, you sort of got descriptive metadata. And uh, this is something that describes, it's, it's for the purposes of discovery and identification. And um, so thinking about the sort of those resources in Kubernetes, well, how do I find uh, services that relate to this part of my organization or are using this technology? Uh, structural metadata is about the grouping of things. So maybe uh, this deployment, obviously, you've got direct relationships between a deployment and a pod, but you might have a number of different deployments that really make up a concept of an application. Like these things are all running. Like having some metadata that groups those together is sort of structural metadata. And finally, administrative metadata, providing some sort of information to help with management. Um, and so, sort of, yeah, again, like, well, when was it created? Maybe you want to react to something being like, that's been there for a year. Is that a good thing? Um, and there are solid use cases around those types of metadata. So and you might be, like I said, that idea of discovery, um, organizing. Uh, and one of the things we'll keep coming back to is the power of metadata for interoperability. Different tools can write metadata. Different tools can read metadata. If we're all doing that in the same place with shared schemas and other bits and pieces, we can build quite interoperable tools without direct integration. And that's really good from a, a, like replacing tools, fighting lock-in, but building an inter interoperable ecosystem. OK, so let's talk more practically about the uh, metadata tooling that exists within Kubernetes itself. Uh, Kubernetes supports labels. Uh, the documentation tells us that labels are key value pairs that are attached to objects, things like uh, pods. Um, they're very much intended to be identifying those objects. They're supposed to be meaningful to you as somebody who is operating Kubernetes. The system itself doesn't do anything with these labels inherently. It, it doesn't imply anything uh, meaningful to Kubernetes itself. But you can use labels for functional purposes, like uh, selecting a group of pods that match a certain label, um, getting logs from pods that match a particular uh, label, and so on. So that it's very useful functionality. 
Um, I meant to warn you, this section could get quite confusing because different, pool, different tools use the same terminology to mean different things. Um, so labels, according to um, Helm best practices, labels should be used if it's identifying a particular resource and if as an operator you're going to find it useful to be able to kind of query, filter on those uh, on resources with that kind of identity. The other kind of metadata that Kubernetes supports is annotations. And this is much more sort of free form data of your choice that you can attach to a resource. Pretty much anything you want can go into an annotation. Uh, examples of things you could, and this is by no means exhausted, exhaustive, uh, information about the, the software that you're running. You could have links or um, references to things related to that resource, perhaps links to where the logs go or where the audits go. Um, even things like who is supporting this particular resource? Who do you contact when this resource goes away? We'll look at a use case related to that uh, later on. Here's another example where we've got, uh, it's an ingress and it's got some uh, information about timeout configurations, essentially. And that can be useful to you as a human being to be able to see what is the, you know, when should this time out? How long should this go before it would time out? You might be sort of saying to yourself, yeah, but how do you know this actually matches what the software knows? Because this is like annotation data. It's, it's not part of the code itself. Turns out there's actually a really useful feature called the Downward API. Um, Gareth actually told me about this as we were building this talk. I hadn't uh, heard of it before. But the Downward API lets you make labels and annotations data accessible to the container itself. So in that example of the Nginx, it could be reading that configuration from the annotations. So the human readable version and the software uh, information are one and the same, which is a good thing. OK, this is where it starts getting a bit confusing. Docker, uh, inside Docker files, you can define labels. These are not the same kind of labels. These are labels that are built into your container images. But they are key value pairs, just like Kubernetes uh, labels are. You can put pretty much anything you want inside a, a label. Gareth and I were uh, involved in a project called Label Schema, which uh, looked at some common uh, kinds of keys that you might want to use in those key value pairs for things like uh, the name of the software, the vendor, um, maybe links to documentation, where you could imagine tooling built on top of that, where if there's a common understanding of how you read the name of a piece of software from the image, that would be helpful for tool tooling purposes. That label schema work has actually been absorbed into the uh, OCI image spec. But just to keep us all on our toes, for some reason, this is called annotations in the OCI image spec, even though it's labels in Dockerfile. I don't know why. N naming is hard. <laughs> naming is hard. So we've looked at um, some existing tools and features that help us with metadata. But what they cover at the moment is, uh, or what we've talked about so far, covers information that you can build into your images and information that you can associate with your software when you deploy it. But there are obviously a whole bunch of other stages that software can go through between those two points. Um, examples of the kind of things that happen post-build, but probably pre-deployment, uh, things like uh, whether or not a piece of software has been approved for deployment, whether or not it's passed tests, and um, vulnerability scan reports. All of these things have to be associated with a specific build of software. You can't have a test report sort of just floating about you know, between different builds. It has to be associated with a specific build. Um, and this information could change over time. 
Vulnerability scanning is a, a really good example where a piece of software doesn't change, but a new exploit could be discovered, and it turns out it existed in that image that you already had. So the vulnerability scan report could change after the fact of the build. So these are examples of cases where the kind of current tooling doesn't really allow us to manage and manipulate metadata. So we sort of know what metadata is. There's some uh, bits and pieces in Kubernetes that we can use to manipulate it. And some tooling or, or other areas of metadata, I guess, that are sort of outside the remit of the direct sort of Kubernetes labels and annotations. But why do we care? Who's it for? Um, and sort of thinking about Kubernetes as, a, as, as software, as a platform, and there really are, the, there are different types of users who like, actually use Kubernetes that are part of this bigger, broader community, and not who are going to be using it um, just as part of their job. They're not as interested in, in it to come to Austin. It's just something there. But one of the interesting things there is there's not really a, a really widely agreed set of sort of user personas or roles at the moment within the community. Um, and so it was just a bit of a side uh, sort of story, uh, because we'll then come back to why we care in, in the context of metadata in a moment. Um, so I ended up uh, speaking to a number of people about this and sort of saying, well, there's not, an there's not a shared agreement yet, but actually, what do other people think? I think I know what I, I think. Um, and a number of people sort of re responded and replied, and I'm not going to read tweets out because it gets really boring. But it was pretty similar to how we'd been talking about it. This idea of actually there being three sort of distinct, sometimes overlapping roles. So you've got the idea of really a, a sort of platform operator, um, sort of responsible for things like the API server and get, like installing Kubernetes, setting it up. They're going to care about HA and and file systems, that, that's sort of the very classical sort of operations aspect. They might not care at all about the things that people do on top of it, unless you bring Kubernetes down, they might get cross. Um, but the actual, they may manage the underlying infrastructure, they may not do. Um, they might be on the other side of, a, of a, a credit card. They might be a service provider, a cloud provider, that's actually just running this for you. Um, You've got the application developers, I and mean, people who actually, they're writing applications, they're, they're writing Java, they're writing Node.js, they're writing Python, they're writing Rails applications. They just want them to run. They might not care that whether it's on Kubernetes or not. They shouldn't have to care unless they're actually going to do fancier things. But they do want to benefit from joined, a sort of joined up understanding with like, certainly the, the sort of platform operators. And I think that, and this is something that's been talked about a, li a little around the sort of Kubernetes community. I think I, think I see uh, Michael in the room. And um, like this concept of application operators, actually, people who are probably going to be more familiar with Kubernetes um, or the sort of platform tools, they're probably the types of people who are looking at like actually Helm packaging or case on it or, or higher level tools for configuration management within <laughs> Kubernetes. They're allowed to set standards for others. They might be, they're operating the application on top of the platform, not installing Kubernetes. Um, in some organizations, that might be the same people. Um, in, in others, in some teams within larger organizations, it might be the same people. Um, or it might be very distinct, actually, organizations completely. Um, and often, where it comes to sort of metadata, it allows us to facilitate communication between these di different teams, groups where they're not sharing the same tools because they're not doing the same jobs. They're not caring about the same things. But you invariably do want information passed from one to another. OK, this is where we get into the fun bit and uh, a bunch of examples that maybe cover some of these uh, different personas. They may be more useful to one or other of these uh, different personas. Um, and uh, we can just explore a few potential use cases for the kind of things you might do with metadata. And this is also where, like, basically, we're going to break all the rules of what you should normally do in demos. So for a start, I'm going to have to turn my phone on to not silent. And um, hopefully, Gareth will do the same. That will make sense soon, but OK. 
Right, so the first example is this idea of wanting to change who the support contact is. Uh, so as an application operator, you want to know that somebody is going to come and uh, sort out problems. There are many ways to solve this problem, but this is a kind of uh, an interesting, interesting use case, I think. And the key thing here is we want to change who the support contact is without redeploying software. So we're going to use a tool that um, I've been working on called Manifesto. Now, the idea behind Manifesto is you have these container images, and they're stored in a registry. And the image is actually made up of a bunch of data blobs. And we're saying we want to associate some arbitrary metadata with a particular image. And the idea we hit upon was why don't we actually store that metadata as data blobs inside the registry along with the image itself? So that's what Manifesto does. Uh, and it also puts together a, a little image that does the mapping between which uh, particular image has which particular bit of metadata. OK. So uh, this is where it also turns into audience participation. There is a really, really crappy website that I've written here. Please feel free to load it, reload it, keep hitting that particular IP address. I'll just say that a few more times so that you have time to uh, forget that IP address, 52.170.3.92. While you're doing that, um, so. Well, earlier on, I set up Gareth's phone number as the support contact. I put Gareth into uh, the metadata for my application. And I'm going to run a little app here. Um, let me just show you what the gist of this app is. So the idea is Kubernetes is using health checks to look at the state of this pod. And it will restart that pod if it fails. And it will fail because it's designed to be really crap. Um, and at a certain point, it will hit crash loop back off status. And at that point, we're going to say, no, things are really bad. Somebody should come and pay attention to this website. So the contact details are associated with the image which has been deployed um, in the pod. And that Twilio app that I just started, the core part of it is essentially uh, when it detects that uh, I mean, it's, it's using kubectl to look at the state of the pod. And if it sees crash loop back off state has been reached, it will run manifesto on whatever the image is for the pod to get the contact information and send a message to Twilio. You need to be refreshing that web page. I, 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 they don't anymore, because I've just been paged. You've been paged? Um, <laughs> I have, I've been paged with the, the Liz Rice Hello Health Check needs some attention, apparently. Right. Uh, which probably means some people have seen the teapot. <laughs> Did you? Uh, it, it just needs to restart. There's only like one instance of it, so and it is deliberately crashing. So. Um, yeah, did you, did you know there is an HTTP status code for teapot? Yes. Mm, pretty cool, right? Um, so if you've been refreshing the page, you may or may not have seen a teapot on occasion. So uh, now I'm going to, in the right window, uh, sorry, Gareth, you're going to get alerted again before I didn't get there quickly enough. Oh, yep, there we go. OK. Yep. So I'm going to take over support now, because it's not fair on Gareth. I wrote this crappy website, so I should really be supporting it now. Might take a minute to, uh, to do this. Demos with network connectivity required. Right. And uh, come on. Just takes a little while to actually do this uh, update into the registry. It will finish. There we go. OK, it's finished. Right, and now we have to also wait for the failure timeout to, uh, uh, to give up. It'll eventually say that uh, it could be alerted again. Keep hitting refresh. Keep hitting refresh. We need it to fail one more time. And eventually, hopefully, the alert will come to me instead of Gareth. I should have made this a shorter time. OK, so now an alert could happen again. It's still failing. And hopefully, 
it will come through to me. If it doesn't, we'll just blame the demo gods and move on to the next one. Here we go. No, I've got a message. Didn't make a noise, but I have. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Good, okay, so that's the first demo. Uh, and the idea there is obviously that we can update information without having to change anything about the software that was deployed. We just changed metadata. Okay, the next demo uses some different tool, uses Manifesto and another different tool. And this is about uh, keeping up to date with security vulnerabilities. So we all need to be aware of you know, the latest uh, exploits that have been discovered, and we need to keep our deployments patched with um, up-to-date code when vulnerabilities get discovered. There is a, uh, a project called Grafaeus. Anybody heard of Grafaeus? A few hands, a few hands. So Grafaeus was uh, started by Google been open sourced by Google, and it's essentially an API for uh, storing, managing, querying metadata related to software packages, not just container images. It could be machine images. It could be all sorts of, all sorts of things. And the core concepts in Grafaeus are notes and occurrences. So a note tells you about a thing, for example, a particular vulnerability. Uh, vulnerabilities are... Um, Identify. There's a standard way of identifying them with what's called a CVE, a Common Vulnerability Enumeration, I think, is what that stands for. Um, so every vulnerability has one of these CVE codes. And in Grafaeus terminology, there would be a note for any given CVE that we might know about. And an occurrence maps a note to a software entity. So there might be an occurrence for an image saying that that image has this particular vulnerability within it. And Grafaeus lets you ask interesting questions across your whole um, sort of deployment of images. So you might, for example, want to know, well, which of my large number of images have this particular vulnerability included in them? And Grafaeus will let you make a query to find that out. So in this demo, we're going to use uh, the output from an Aqua uh, vulnerability scan, and we're going to convert it into Grafaeus notes and occurrences. Uh, we had an intern called uh, Itai Gill who wrote a reformatter for me. He wanted to make sure he got credit, so there you go, Itai, you got credit. Um, uh, so that will reformat the scan report into notes and occurrences. And I've also been working on making Manifesto take alternative kind of back-end storages for, for metadata, where the idea is that you can use Manifesto to manipulate Grafaeus databases as well. And then we can run these kind of powerful Grafaeus queries over the data that's been stored. Okay, wish me luck with the demo gods again, right? So, I don't need this window anymore. We've done that. Right, so uh, this is Aqua, and I'm just going to add uh, Mongo 321 is kind of well, it's a very old version of, of Mongo that uh, I know has quite a lot of vulnerabilities in it. So there's a scan in process there, and uh, here we go, just in time to see the scan completed, and the reformatter has just created a bunch of um, notes and occurrence files. So uh, if I try and query, at the moment I haven't stored them in Grafaeus, so they're not there yet. Um, I can, uh, let's do put. So I'm going to store the files that are stored in that Mongo321 directory at the end. I'm going to store those in the Grafaeus database uh, using Manifesto. So now if I... Uh, well, actually, let's list what's there, make sure that I can see them, see package vulnerability. Yeah, so I have now got package vulnerability data, and if I run the get, there will be tons of it, loads of data there. But I can also do things like 
this is kind of uh, the Grafeus format API, uh, where I can uh, say, can't find my cursor, there it is. Uh, I am basically saying, tell me about all the occurrences related to the note about this particular CVE. Uh, I think, oops, yeah, so let's do, this one is a fake one, so there aren't any instances of that one, but, uh, and this one is a real one, and there was an instance of it, and we get up here the, uh, the name of the image, it was, it was Mongo, it's identified by its digest rather than a particular um, label, which begins 1914. And if I go back in here, I can just verify. Uh, it's probably a bit small to see, but down here there is the Docker Digest, and it does indeed begin 1914. So that was the right metadata for the right image stored in Grafeus. If you're interested in Grafeus, there is a boff this evening about it, and there's also a meeting on Friday morning about it here. Okay. This is one that I'm not actually going to demo, just sort of due to time, but um, there is, well, Kelsey basically put together a Grafeus tutorial uh, which does this particular um, admission control pattern. As an application operator, there may be things that I want to check for before software is allowed to run in my deployment. Uh, the admission control pattern is basically saying, before you actually go ahead with the deployment, validate that some standards, whatever it is we want to check for in the metadata, uh, has been complied with. So if you look for Kelsey's Grafeus tutorial, you'll find uh, a sort of walkthrough there of checking that images have been signed by an authoritative source before they can actually be deployed into your Kubernetes running deployment. Over to you, Gareth. Okay, so one of the things about metadata is it being so, like, sort of, I guess, piecemeal, different types of metadata for different purposes, is that you can have lots of it that's unrelated. But often you can build really interesting things by combining different sources of metadata. So um, I'm going to look at a quick example. And these, again, like the, the similar to the other demos, these are illustrative of the types of things you can build really easily on top of metadata. So as an application operator, so that I can help teams with audits, I want to know what software packages different teams are using. So uh, I'll use a tool um, that I worked on at work, but is open source, called Lumigon. It's basically uh, a tool for scanning uh, running containers and collecting actually all sorts of different metadata from different sources about them. So it grabs a bunch from the Docker API as well as from actually what's inside that container, what like, packages happen to be there, what container happens to be there. Um, uh, like all good tools, it actually just outputs a lot of data. Um, it, it's sort of a low-level tool that's useful to build things on top of um, more than a fancy end user type thing. Uh, for part of the fancy end user type thing, uh, which actually covers a lot more than containers, uh, Lumigon's a sort of low-level component of Puppet Discovery, which is uh, something that some of my colleagues work on at work. So, the two bits of metadata I'm sort of interested in for this, to solve this problem I have, are, well, Kubernetes labels, they provide me a mechanism to, uh, to store things. And in this case, I'm gonna store, uh, basically, a mapping between deployments and the team that manages them. Uh, having those in labels is also handy because can, I can filter them. I can use any of the Kubernetes sort of native tools to go, oh, which, like, give me all the logs from that team, give, give me the, t the deployments from that team, when I'm talking to them, uh, that's quite handy. And Lumigon provides the metadata about packages in the containers, which are in the pods, which were created by the deployments. Uh, as I say, I've not quite got enough time, I think, uh, looking at the clock, to actually run through this demo, but this is sort of the output. Um, and there's a, I, just a couple of, and again, like small Python scripts, sort of 10 lines or so of code each. Uh, if you want to have a look at them, the links will be don't try to type that out. But uh, now, obviously, this will share the slides later. But you can end up with a table like this, where this, this actually lists, you, and you run this against your Kubernetes cluster, it collects data from these different sources, and says, well, actually, these are all the packages, 
software packages that we found across the entire set of, of containers running. Um, these are all the different versions. These are how many times we found them. And these are the teams that uh, were using them. Um, obviously, you might chop and change this in different ways. You might combine different sources of data. But the, the thing there is just how easy it is to do if you have good metadata to build high-level tools that ask quite actually like interesting questions. Um, you probably wouldn't invest in, like, this isn't big enough to be an application on its own, but it's easy and simple to build things on top of metadata. So this one I should hopefully have time to dive into. One of the sort of things that will probably come to mind is, well, what about metadata quality? It's fine to say, oh, oh great, I can, I can filter all, all of the deployments by team. Uh, or, or route back packages to the right team, or, or oh yeah, like route um, uh, pages to the right support contact. But what if, uh, well, they haven't bothered to add that data. So they haven't actually added the label for team. They haven't actually included any data about a support contact or how, how that should, someone should be paged. That start, the, the, the sort of building things on top of metadata starts to fall down. Because the responses won't, I like in that example with the table, well, it would be missing some teams that might be doing something bad. Um, if it was a paging thing, well, actually, the page goes into the ether and no one cares that the application is down. Um, and it, that sounds bad. So actually having a way of enforcing, actually having standards around, well, yes, you have to do these things. Um, the reality is a Word document or like for modern people, a markdown file in the Git repository saying like, you must have these labels isn't enough. It's, it's, it's likely a, like something, it's a starting point. It's a part of the discussion about, well, what should be required? What, what's optional? But actually, it's, it's a terrible way of enforcing something. Um, the sort of Word document and like going around to meetings and going like, you haven't added your labels. It's like, that sounds a waste of time. Uh, so, one of the tools I'm going to talk a lot more about uh, tomorrow in the uh, talk about sort of developer tooling is KubeTest. So this is, uh, like briefly, basically a unit testing tool for Kubernetes configurations. Um, you point it at a config file, you point it at a bunch of tests, uh, you have assertions and they will pass or fail. Um, sort of fairly straightforward. I'll show this working in a second. And you actually write tests in Skylark, which is basically a, a Python dialect, for, but can be embedded in tools. So this is a test to actually ensure the configs actually do have a label for T. Um, again, like saying, well, actually, if it's a deployment, grab the labels, assert that the labels contain T. Uh, all fairly straightforward. So let's go actually have a look at that. Oh. Am I over here? Oh. Uh, It'd be all the way to the left. All the way to the left. <laughs> One more. One more. Okay using someone else's computer. <laughs> so um, I happen to have uh, the test that we just saw in, in a test folder, obviously tiny text, but you've seen it before. Um, I've, got, oh, I've also got a, a deployment. So the deployment, uh, if you're eagle-eyed, basically has the labels uh, team, uh, team Shamu, uh, is actually commented out. <laughs> So this, this is actually not a good deployment. I don't want this deployment to pass through my CI pipeline. Uh, so I'm going to run kubetest. Uh, kubetest is just a little CLI tool. Um, we should just be able to run it against that uh, deployment. And we get a warning. We get uh, saying, well, actually, this doesn't contain team. Labels do not contain team. The output could be better. And obviously, that should fail with non-zero access code. So like from a, you'd put this into a pipeline, and it would not work. It's going to tell you earlier that, like, no, I'm not going to deploy this until you fix that. So let's go fix it. Um, let's say for, for quick. Uh, we could pass for both, and we'll see the passing assertions as well. And obviously, that should. Oh. Uh, 
exit with a zero exit. So, so we've got a, a mechanism to enforce standards about our metadata. Um, and if you can have reliable metadata, then it's much, much easier to build reliable tools on top. Right. So we've run through a, a number of different demos. Each of them individually, obviously, we could spend a lot of time just digging into and making a full thing. What we're really trying to do is say, like, look how easy it is to build things on top of metadata and the types of things you can do. Um, and coming back to those sort of those personas as well, and if you are, if you do sort of fit into the sort of the Kubernetes operator, like think about what metadata would make debugging a platform problem easier. Like, wh like that's one of the times you really want those sort of that, those tools and that the ability to ask questions across your infrastructure and discover just the right thing, not everything else. What would make that easier? Um, as an application developer. Like, at, start adding metadata to your applications. Um, there probably is a time where you've added too much, but that's probably not to start with. Um, and like, that's a problem for another day. Uh, start adding metadata. You, like, whoever's running your application, whether it's you or someone else, will thank you later. And I think this is the sort of like, the application operator. Well, let's start talking about tools. Let's start talking about schemas. Let's start talking about interoperability and solving like, the problems for application developers and for operators. And summing up, Metadata provides a, a really super flexible platform for building useful tools on top of. And I think with that Metadata, we can make managing Kubernetes systems and deploying to Kubernetes systems easier and more pleasurable. So there's a few links there to uh, some of the tools that we've shown uh, this afternoon. Uh, they're all on GitHub. Uh, some of them are, you know, pretty early stage projects, so you know, very much welcoming feedback and uh, and help and ideas around those. Uh, we're probably pretty much out of time, we're done. but uh, we'll be around. So if you want to come and grab us outside for questions, that would be great. Yep. Thank and you so much. Thank you.